Okay, welcome back. In this video, we'll go over chapter number four. In chapter four, we will cover uh, the cells. All right, cells are the basic building blocks of all of all humans. Now they come in a variety of different shapes and sizes and different types, you know, such as nerve cells, and skin cells, and blood cells. They're all still technically cells, but all those are very, very different from each other. They have different functions, different structures. Uh, they're organized differently. So we will talk about just a generic cell uh, to begin with. Our cells will consist of some basic uh, component parts. The cell structures are called organelles, and that word basically breaks down into small organs. And those organelles have very specific functions. There's like uh, in your body, an organ has a very particular function. If your stomach does something that your brain would not or your heart would not they have very particular functions just for that one structure so organelles work the same way now when you have groups of cells that have the same function uh, working together they form an organ and then when you have multiple organs working for or with the same function that creates an organ system such as the you know, cardiovascular system you know, uh, digestive system and so on and then we have multiple systems working together as where you, where you have a, a functioning organism, such as the human body. All right, the learning objectives uh, for this chapter. Be able to list and describe the various parts of a cell and explain their function. Explain the process of uh, cellular mitosis. Uh, describe cancer growth and cancer staging. And describe the various types of transport, both active and passive, within cells. Also, explain cellular re respiration and enzyme function and dysfunction, and be able to differentiate between bacteria, viruses, and fungi, uh, and protozoa, and understand how all these can cause disease. A basic overview of cells. Cells are found in all living things. It's one of the key characteristics of a living structure, that they're made up of cells. And cells are formed from uh, chemicals and other uh, structures found with inside. Like I mentioned before, all cells will Cells will vary greatly in size and shape and structure, and some nerve cells can be over two feet long, and these are actually visible with the human eye. Now, cells can be uh, flat or round or thread-like or uh, very irregular shape. It just depends on what type of cell we're talking about, what their function is. There are roughly seven and a half trillion cells found in a human body. Of course, that is an approximation. It'd be very difficult to get an exact number because you have cells. Uh, dying all the time and cells dividing and reproducing all the time. And this has to happen in order to allow for you know, digestion, uh, respiration, uh, reproduction, movement, and so on. So this number is not a static number. This will change constantly. Now, some cells divide uh, all the time and some cells hardly ever divide. A good image of a, a variety of the different cells that we have. The connective tissue cells here, uh, a bone cell or an osteocyte, a nerve cell, We'll talk about those structures in more detail in the future chapter. Uh, an ovum or an egg, sperm cells, a fat cell, a skeletal muscle, nerve cell in the brain, uh, blood cells, and so on. So all of these are examples of cells with particular functions. But as you can tell just by a quick glance, there's a variety of different shapes that they go along with a cell. Now there are some common traits that all cells share. And some of those are a nucleus, you know, the control center, you know, the brain of the, of the cell. Various organelles, you know, the structures that have a very specific function within the cell. Uh, cytoplasm, the jelly where all the organelles will, will sit within the cell. And then the cell membrane, uh, which is the outermost barrier of a cell. And this is sometimes called the plasma membrane. This is what will control what enters and what exits the cell. So even though there is a variety of different shapes for cells, cells will have these common traits among them, regardless of their shape, regardless of their function. All right, here's a generic uh, composite image of a cell. If you were to cut it open and see inside uh, some of the organelles, you know, the nucleus here, you know, the control center, uh, the cytoplasm, this jelly-like uh, goo that the organelles sit in, and these individual structures that you see, and we'll talk about a lot of these uh, here in the next few minutes, these are all individual organelles, like mitochondria, the rough uh, ER, uh, smooth they are, uh, lysosome, ribosome, all those are examples of organelles. All right, we'll start with the, the outermost portion, the cell membrane. This is what will uh, define the shape of the cell. It's what helps uh, keep the cell together. 
a protective covering, the outermost barrier. It's described as being selectively permeable, which means some things can get in, but some things can't. Some things can go out, but some things can't. It is selective on what gets able or what is able to pass through and either enter or exit the cell. Now, the cell membrane has uh, identification markers that identify it as being from a very particular type of tissue from that individual person. So you're able to tell from who a cell came from or from who a tissue came from. And that's for how thick uh, the cell membrane is. Uh, a good approximation is it is three ten millionths of an inch thick. So think of an inch, break it up into ten million pieces, and three of those, that's how wide a plasma membrane is. All right, here's an overview of the uh, cell membrane and how it looks. It has a very particular uh, setup with the phospholipids forming that phospholipid bilayer and the hydrophilic heads facing the water, either outside the cell or inside the cell, and hydrophobic tails are facing each other. It's called a phospholipid bilayer because there are two. One layer up here, one layer down here. And this is what will circle all the way around the cell. Now within that cell membrane you'll have different uh, cholesterols and different proteins. You know, some will go all the way through like this one. Some will like, go partial and partial part of the way through. They have sugars that are on the surface and so on. So it's not just the, the phospholipid bilayer that, that you'll find in the cell membrane. You'll find other stuff inserted within it. And these structures here, the uh, these transmembrane proteins, uh, is something that is very important to get stuff in and out of the cell, which is something that we'll talk about next. Okay, in order for a cell to be able to do anything, it has to be able to get materials that it needs in and get waste and toxins out of the cell. And there are two uh, generic ways material can get moved in and out of the cell. Uh, passive transport, that's the type of transport that does not require any energy at all. It's passive. And then active transport. This is a type of transport that does require energy. And there are multiple forms of, of each one. Uh, some examples of passive transport. Uh, diffusion, osmosis, uh, filtration, and facilitated diffusion. And we'll discuss uh, all four of these here next. But all four of these fall under the uh, general category of being passive transport. None of these four require any extra energy for this to happen. All right, first one we'll go over, uh, diffusion, uh, the most common type of uh, passive transport, where you have an area or a substance moving from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. And that difference is called a concentration gradient. And a good example of this would be if you were to uh, sit in a, a classroom or a, an office and spray something that smells really good or really bad in the front of the classroom, the students in the front row would smell it first, and the people in the back, it would take a little while for that smell to spread out equally and diffuse across the entire room. So if we were to use that classroom example, the students in the first row, that area would be highly concentrated for that smell. The students in the back row, it would be very poorly concentrated. So diffusion will work as the molecules will spread out equally and at random until this is an equally uh, distributed scent. So that's going from an area of high concentration, like it would be in the front row, to an area of low concentration to the back row until there's an equal uh, distribution. Now this type of transport is critical for you being able to breathe. This is how oxygen will move uh, into your blood so it can be delivered to your cells and also the removal of carbon dioxide from your blood to the lungs so it can be breathed out. So something as vital you know, to living as breathing all relies on simple diffusion in the lungs. Okay, and here's an example of uh, diffusion, which is a commonly used example. Here's a beaker of water and uh, dropping in a cube of uh, most likely sugar. Once you drop it in, right here is very highly concentrated and say up here is very poorly concentrated. There's a lot here and little to none up here. This will start to break down slowly and randomly disperse until there's an equal distribution throughout the whole beaker. It's the same thing with or spraying that smell in that classroom that we talked about. Now, this area right here will be the front row for students. This will be the back row of students. Highly concentrated here for right, right where you sprayed that, sm that scent and very poorly uh, concentrated in the back because they haven't 
had the chance to smell it yet. It hasn't been, the molecules haven't gotten there yet. But if you give it enough time, there will be an equal distribution. Right. Next type of fast transport, osmosis. This is another form of diffusion where you have water moving across a selectively permeable membrane to equalize concentrations of a substance. And that substance is called the solute. So it's very similar to diffusion, but you're involving the movement of water. The reason for the movement of this water is to equalize concentrations of solute on either side of a selectively permeable membrane. And the reason why this happens is nature likes balance. Nature wants to be as stable as possible. So you don't want too much of something over here versus over here. You know, if there's too much sugar on this side of the membrane and not enough over here, it's going to be equalized. If there's too much salt on one side of the membrane versus another side, then the water will rush in to balance that out. Okay. The ability to pull water toward an area of fire concentration of that solute is called the osmotic pressure. So the greater concentration of that solute, the greater the osmotic pressure would be to bring in that water and to equalize the solute concentration. Okay. Here's what I mean by that. I say you have one large, say, uh, like an aquarium tank filled with water, and you have a selectively uh, permeable membrane you know, that's dividing the tank in half. These little purple dots are solute, let's say sugar, for example, sugar or salt. There are more of those circles on this side of the membrane than there are here. So there's a higher concentration on this side, lower concentration on this side. So what happens is water will rush toward the higher concentrated side to equal out uh, the solute concentrations. Well, when that happens, you get this result. Water leaves this area of the tank that goes into here. Now, to neutralize the effect of having more sugar molecules or more salt molecules, let's say generic more, uh, more of a salt or solute in general. So that's the movement of water, you know, starting off where they were equal, going to here, you know, in order to balance out concentrations of solute. So it's the movement of water across that membrane. Now this can be, this process can be very, very dangerous when it comes to uh, human cells. Uh, for example, if a red blood cell is put into a concentration or, or in a solution where there's more solute on the outside, then this process happens. Water will leave the red blood cell to neutralize the concentration, but by doing so, the red blood cell will shrivel up or crenate and then won't be able to function. And the opposite of that is true also. If there is more uh, concentration of a solute within a cell uh, compared to the solution outside, water will rush into it to, ne to neutralize that effect, but by doing so, that cell will fill up with water and eventually pop like a balloon. In that case, you have what's called hemolysis, the lysing of a blood cell. So when that happens, the cell is gone. If it's not there, obviously it can't function. So nature wants a balance. If you have too much of something, uh, the cell won't work properly. If it had, the cell has too little of something, it won't work properly. All right, next we'll talk about uh, filtration. All right, this differs from osmosis uh, in that the pressure that is applied uh, to force water and dissolve materials across the membrane. An example that's given here, uh, think of a crowd of people pushing through turnstiles during uh, rush hour. Now the major supplier of this force is the pumping of the heart, which forces blood you know, into the kidneys you know, to be filtered. And the higher the you know, filtration rate, the faster things can get filtered out of the kidneys and faster you get toxins out of your body. So this is something that is being driven by the contractions of the heart muscle. Now, here's an image of uh, filtration in the inside of the kidneys. And this is a process we'll talk in more detail uh, in a future video. As the blood gets pumped through uh, certain structures within the kidney, uh, things that are small will be filtered out, such as you know, potassium ion and sodium ion. But things that are a little bit larger and can't fit through these holes will not be filtered. So think of this as a as a, a kitchen strainer. And say so you have a a pile of say pasta and water and you put it through the strainer. Water will go through it but the things that are larger like the pasta will not be filtered because they're too large. Alright another type of passive transport uh, facilitated diffusion. This is similar to uh, regular diffusion 
but this is helped with the the presence of uh, very special proteins within the cell membrane. So you basically have diffusion being helped or being facilitated by the presence of these transmembrane proteins. So compounds that are larger, compounds that have an electrical charge to them, can easily get into the cell or out of the cell. They need to be escorted in and escorted out. An example that's given here, imagine a, a revol revolving door around a circle. Once you get into that door as it's moving, you are basically escorted or kind of pushed through before you get to the other side of the building. And here's an image of that. And then once you get in, you're going to get you know, pushed back out to the other side of that, that door. The same thing here. Things like glucose, uh, other larger compounds, can't squeeze through you know, this network of uh, phospholipids. They're too, are too tightly bound together. So in order for them to get in the cell, they, need, they basically need a, a tunnel or a way to kind of guide them in or guide them out. So glucose, is represented by this uh, trapezoid shape, it will enter the carrier protein or that transmembrane protein and be delivered inside the cell. So if that protein isn't here, glucose would not be able to get into the cell or get out of the cell because there's not enough space between these individual phospholipids here. This is how most stuff gets into the cell through uh, carrier or transmembrane proteins. So it's diffusion, but being helped or facilitated by proteins. All right, now we'll talk quickly about a uh, pathology connection between uh, facilitated diffusion and uh, a disease. And disease in particular is cystic fibrosis, or CF. Now this is a fatal genetic disease. Uh, it's incurable. This is found between one in every 3,000 uh, Caucasian births. Now this is caused by a malformation in the membrane channels for chloride and sodium ions. So sodium and chloride are not able to diffuse across the cell membrane like they normally should or normally would. So the fluid around the cells becomes very, very salty compared to the, the other cells because of the buildup of the excess chloride and excess sodium. So this results in a very, very thick layer of mucus uh, that's found in the digestive tracts and the respiratory tracts and the reproductive tracts around the organs. Now some common symptoms of CF, uh, difficulty breathing, uh, nutritional deficits because you have a decreased, decreased function of uh, absorption of nutrients, uh, much higher risk for respiratory infections, uh, diabetes, and infertility, especially in males. And the treatment for CF, uh, like I mentioned before, there's no cure for it. You can treat it, but you can't you know, cure it. The, the treatments include uh, nutritional supplements, antibiotics, keep pneumonia at bay. Uh, there are some drugs that you can take to help thin out the, the amount of mucus buildup. And the sad thing is the average lifespan with treatment is roughly about 35 years. See the way you diagnose CF? Uh, prenatal uh, genetic testing and, and postnatal uh, genetic testing. And being able to test the amount of sodium uh, in sweat, which is, as you can imagine, a little bit less accurate than genetic testing. Uh, another disease that's related uh, here, uh, diabetes mellitus, uh, very common health problem. When you hear uh, diabetes and you know, type 1, type 2, that is a reference to diabetes mellitus. This is a problem due to uh, facilitated diffusion. You have glucose that's transported in the cells via this process of you know, facilitated diffusion. But a very particular hormone, insulin, must be present in order for that to happen. If insulin isn't there, then the glucose can't get into the cells. So what you have with uh, diabetes mellitus, insulin is either not there at all, or the cells are not able to uh, receive insulin. They're, not, they're, they're described as being insensitive to insulin. So insulin may be there in more than enough quantity, but the cells don't recognize it, it's not going to work. So both of these result in the cells not getting, cells not getting the glucose that they need as an energy source. So this lack of glucose transport can lead to any number of problems, such as uh, glucose being in uh, the bloodstream, which causes a very large uh, problem with osmotic uh, pressure. Uh, cells can't make enough energy because glucose is the main source of fuel for cells, and your body will need to get energy from somewhere. So if it can't get it from glucose, it'll get it from fat or muscle. All right, those were the forms of uh, passive transport, the kind that do not require any extra energy to happen. 
And now we'll talk about uh, active transports, the ones that do require energy to happen. And then you have uh, active transport pumps, you have endocytosis, then exocytosis. All right, first we'll talk about the, uh, the pumps. Now this requires the addition of the energy molecule, uh, ATP, adenosine triphosphate. You know, if that molecule isn't there, then nothing in this section of this lecture can happen. And the reason why you need energy is you're going the opposite way regarding a concentration gradient than you would with passive transport. You're moving from an area of low concentration to an area of high concentration. You basically are going uphill as opposed to going downhill. So it takes energy to go against the grain here. So the example that's listed, uh, it, you need to transport potassium into our cells where they're highly concentrated to begin with already. So you need an extra effort to basically push it in to crowd it into the cell. So you're going against the concentration gradient. It's going to take more effort to get that to finish. All right, endocytosis. Uh, the prefix endo always means inside. So you're taking material inside of a cell, such as liquid or such as uh, solid particles like a virus or a bacteria or so on. So taking material inside of a cell. And this requires energy. And depending on what type of material that you are taking in, it has a very particular name for each type. If you are taking in something solid, you know, like a virus, like a bacteria, that's considered to be phagocytosis. If you're taking in something liquid, such as water, it's called pinocytosis. These are both forms of endocytosis, and they both require energy. But it is, it is differentiated depending on what type of material that you are taking in. And when that happens, you are forming uh, a small vesicle around the material that you are engulfing to keep it separate from other parts of the cell. Of course, the opposite of that would be exocytosis. You think of exo as exiting or leaving a cell. This is how you get rid of material that the cell doesn't need. Any, anything in excess or any kind of waste products, the cell doesn't need to hold on to it, so the cell wants to get rid of it. And of course, this takes energy also. So things that the cell does not need, it's basically wrapped in a, a small vesicle. That vesicle will bind to the cell membrane, and material is basically ejected out of the cell. And that vesicle will remain uh, bonded to the cell membrane. Right, here's an example of the uh, different types of active transport we just talked about. Uh, this one, probably the most commonly referenced one when we talk about the pumps, the sodium-potassium pump. And this is something that we will reference again later on when we get to the nervous system. A phagocytosis. Now think of this as being a bacteria. So your your immune cell will surround it and engulf it and then destroy it. A pinocytosis, taking in something uh, liquid based like water. Same thing. You are forming a, a small vesicle around it. You to keep it separate. And take that in. So both of these, this one, this one, this one, all require energy. These two, you're taking something into the cell. The exocytosis, uh, taking some debris or some trash that the cell doesn't need, wrapping it in a vesicle. That vesicle will bind to the cell membrane and whatever is inside that vesicle is ejected out. And the vesicle that's left over will remain uh, bonded to the cell membrane. So all these images are examples of active transport. All of these require energy to function. If the molecule ATP is not there to provide that energy, None of this happens. All right, here's a good table that has all the different types of transport, both active and passive, what their names are and what they do. We're all on one slide. So it's a good way to summarize all the different types. All right, next we'll talk about a pathology condition. And this condition is where the levels of blood cholesterol are too high. And this is called familial hypercholesterolemia. Now this is caused when the, the bad types of cholesterol, the LDL, are very, very high. And that's the, the LDL, the low-density lipoprotein. That is the bad cholesterol. Now, for people who don't have this condition, uh, this LDL that's in your blood is bound to cholesterol. So you have this LDL and the cholesterol move into cells uh, via endocytosis. Now, once inside, the cell uses the cholesterol to make other lipids, other fats. But with people who have this condition, the LDL doesn't move into the cells. It just hangs out in the blood. So this is why the levels of LDL get higher and higher and higher. And this causes two major problems. You have too little cholesterol moving into the cells. So cells have to make more on their own. 
And then when you have LDL just hanging around in blood, this causes plaques and blood vessels. And these plaques will end up causing blockages in blood vessels. So when this becomes very severe, you have patients who can end up having heart attacks or strokes, even as a ch or child. This, this, this condition can be very fatal for teenagers and children, and there's no real effective treatment for this condition. In a moderate form, this condition will lead to heart attacks and strokes, but usually not until uh, middle age for most people. Uh, this can be treated with uh, diet modifications and certain cholesterol-lowering drugs. And this affects about one out of every 500 Americans. Uh, they have uh, this moderate form of this condition. All right, now we'll move into uh, various organelles and structures of a general cell in the body. We've already talked about the uh, cell membrane. Now we'll move into the uh, cytoplasm. This is a very gel-like uh, solution, a, a watery substance of organic and inorganic uh, chemicals that are found within the cell membrane. And this is where you find the proteins, and carbohydrates, and lipids, and and organelles. And this helps to regulate the exchange of materials uh, within the cell uh, environment. All right, the next organelle we'll talk about, the nucleus. This is the command center of the cell or the brain of the cell. This is what will dictate to other organelles what they should be doing. And this is surrounded by a, a double layer of phospholipids, just like the cell membrane wraps around the cell. Because the nucleus is so important, this will be covered by a bilayer of phospholipids also, called the nuclear envelope or the nuclear membrane. And only certain things are allowed in to the nucleus because it is so important. Within the nucleus, you'll find a material called chromatin. This is the material that's found in the nucleus that contains your DNA, the deoxyribonucleic acid. Now, this DNA is what will make you, you. This will contain the blueprints or the specs for the creation of a new cell. This will eventually will form chromosomes, which will have genes, which will pass on our genetic information from uh, parent, the child, and so on. So the chromatin is what's found, or one of the many things found inside the nucleus. Also within the nucleus, you have a, a very dense area called the nucleolus. It's a round, uh, spherical body where you have very dense fibers. And it's in this organelle, the nucleolus, is where you get RNA that's formed, the ribonucleic acid. And ribosomes are very critical for making proteins. The generic image of the cell, just focusing on uh, the nucleus and the cytoplasm. The cytoplasm, all that material found amongst the cell membrane, where everything basically kind of sits in. Uh, the control center, the nucleus. And inside the nucleus, you have the nucleolus, the very dense area where ribosomes are composed. All right, speaking of ribosomes, these are organelles that are also found on what's called the endoplasmic reticulum, or the ER, and also floating around within the cell or within the cytoplasm. Now these ribosomes are made up of RNA and are the site of production of enzymes and other proteins that are, made for, that are needed for say, cell repair, uh, reproduction, and so on. So ribosomes are a very important part of the cell. So no matter how uh, simple an organism is, they will usually have some ribosomes found within their cells in order to make proteins so they can function. These are also the uh, manufacturing plant for rebuilding materials and remodeling and repair. So all proteins are made due to the presence of ribosomes. So if ribosomes aren't there, proteins can't be made. So if the nucleolus isn't working properly, that means no ribosomes. No ribosomes, no proteins. No proteins, that's going to impact hundreds of, of functions within your cells and within your body. All right, the next part, uh, centrosomes. These basically act as a building contractor. These will uh, build new structures as they are needed. And these contain uh, centrioles that are, with, that are involved with uh, cell division, which we'll talk about toward the end of this video. And these centrioles are tube-shaped structures that usually are found in pairs that help the cells to divide properly. All right, adding a little more to the, uh, the composite generic image of the cell, the centriole here. Here you have the centrosomes here and here, and within it you have the centrioles, which play a critical role with cell division. And the new organelle that we haven't talked about yet, but we are next, are these, the mitochondria. Now the mitochondria have a very distinct shape to them, a little bean shape. They're fairly large as organelles go. These are often, call, often called the powerhouse of the cell. 
this is the organelle that creates the cell's energy that your body needs. So up to 95% of the energy that you use are, is produced by mitochondria within cells. So these are critically important for cell function, reproduction, movement, cell repair, immunity. Anything that your cell needs energy for, which is almost anything, mitochondria must produce the energy for that. So if a cell requires uh, more power to function, it will increase the number of mitochondria it has in that cell. So a good example would be uh, muscle tissue. And because you move all the time, even when you are at rest or even when you're asleep, your muscles are still going to be moving. So it's going to require a lot of energy. So skeletal muscle will have a lot more mitochondria than other types of tissues would. Another example would be uh, cells in the liver. Because your liver is so... Uh, vital and so important, it remains you know, pretty active you know, on, on a daily basis. So you'll find up to 2,000 mitochondria in each liver cell. All right, within the mitochondria, you'll find uh, very special enzymes that help uh, take in oxygen and use that to produce uh, energy. Now this energy is produced in the compound we've already talked about before, ATP, adenosine triphosphate. So it's the mitochondria that help make ATP. All right, the next structure we'll talk about, uh, the ER, endoplasmic reticulum. This is a series of channels that are set up uh, throughout the cytoplasm that help move material around the cell. There are two uh, distinct forms of the ER. You have a smooth and you have rough ER. One is called the rough ER because it looks rough. It looks like you would do sprinkle pepper on you know, these tubings you know, throughout the, the cytoplasm. So it looks rough. So on the rough ER, this is the site that is responsible for uh, protein synthesis. And the actual organelles that are you know, sprinkled throughout these series of tubes are the ribosomes. So ribosomes are found within, within the rough ER. Now the other type, the smooth ER, does not have ribosomes on it. It looks much smoother compared to the rough ER. And for the smooth ER, their main function is to uh, synthesize steroids and fats. So two different types of structures, two different functions. So here you have a a series of flattened sacs here and here. And you can see the small dots kind of scattered throughout here and here. Those small dots would be ribosomes. So that'd be the rough ER, rough ER here. You can also see the, the free floating ribosomes, these small dots here. The same dots you would find here and here. This is a series of those flattened channels, those flattened tubes, but there are no ribosomes on it. So that'd be the smooth ER. So that looks smooth and that looks rough. So rough smooth. That helps to make proteins. This helps to make fats. All right, next structure, the Golgi apparatus. Sometimes this is called the Golgi body. This is a, a series of uh, very flattened membranous sacs. Now once a protein from the ER uh, gets made, it has to be uh, finalized. It has to be that rough draft of the protein has to be finished. So that happens at the Golgi. So the Golgi will uh, take the processed protein where it needs to go when it's finished and deliver that protein. So the Golgi will, will really modify and package and deliver proteins and take them to where they need to go. Some structures will have more Golgi uh, than others, such as the salivary glands and the glands of the, of the pancreas. They will have higher numbers of the Golgi apparatus because they have a higher need and higher level of secretion or storage. Our next structure we'll talk about, lysosomes. These are uh, small uh, vesicles that contain very powerful enzymes that help destroy any uh, waste or any cellular debris. This is where stuff goes to be destroyed, basically. What your cell doesn't need, it will send here. These enzymes will break it down and to dissolve it away. And the prefix uh, lys or lyso means to break up. So this will basically dissolve away any junk that your cell doesn't need or doesn't want. So whenever you have, uh, say, immune cells engulf in, uh, say, bacteria, for example, through phagocytosis, that will be bound to a lysosome to be destroyed. All right, some other uh, interesting parts of the cell. Uh, vesicles. Uh, you think of these as you know, little vehicles or little trucks. This will help move material around the cell, both taking material into a cell and getting material out of a cell. Uh, the cytoskeleton. A very large network of uh, microtubules that are interconnected that help provide the shape of the cell. And think of this as the uh, inner scaffolding of a cell. 
Uh, these next two are always kind of grouped together because they have the same function, but they are very different in in shape. Uh, flagella and cilia. Flagella. This is a long uh, whip-shaped tail that helps uh, helps the cell move, and the cilia are going to be very short and very hair-like, but also allow for movement. So these are both used for motion, but flagella are going to be very very long. Usually only found in very low numbers, no more than one. Uh, some bacteria you'll see in higher numbers, but for human cells, usually just one. And for cilia, you'll find them in very high numbers grouped together, and there's, these are going to be very short. All right, next we'll talk about a, another pathology connection with some uh, organelle disorders. And the, the disease we'll talk about is called Tay-Sachs disease. Now, in this disease, you have an enzyme that's missing from lysosomes of cells of the nervous system. So as a result, you have uh, glycoproteins that are building up within the nervous system. Now, this buildup will cause a inflammation and eventually will destroy cells. And it gets progressively worse and worse and worse. Common symptoms are mental uh, regression, uh, dementia, and paralysis. Usually all of these will appear within the first year or so of the person's life. Now sadly there is no treatment for Tay-Sachs and this disease will, is usually fatal within the first three years of onset. The way to diagnose uh, Tay-Sachs, an appearance of a very bright cherry red spot on the back of the patient's eyes and there are abnormalities in the startle reflex. A very common, uh, commonly found reflex in, in infants, when they're startled, they react a certain way. But for babies with Tay-Sachs, they don't respond that way at all. Now, the availability of genetic testing to identify this has decreased the incidence of Tay-Sachs within uh, the recent years. And this is all due to a, a disorder with lysosomes in the cells not working properly. All right, another uh, pathology connection with uh, some organelle disorders, uh, cigarettes and paralyzed cilia. For people who smoke, the cilia that are found in your respiratory tract will often become paralyzed. Normally that cilia is there to help move gunk out of your out of your trachea, you know, your respiratory tract, move it up so you can swallow it so it goes down to your stomach to be dissolved and gotten rid of. But as you smoke, the cilia can't move, they can't function. So this is why people who smoke often have that smoker's cough. It takes more of an effort to get that gunk up and out of their body. So the more you smoke, or the longer you smoke, or both, the serious, or the more serious this becomes. So over time, this can lead to COPD, chronic obstructive uh, pulmonary disease. Now even passive smoking, you know, the exposure to cigarette smoke to non-smokers, this will increase your risk for COPD related diseases. So even if you personally are not a smoker, if you live with a smoker, or if you hang out with smokers, you are increasing your risk to develop COPD or other respiratory disorders later on. All right, now we'll talk about some uh, cellular processes. One compound we've already talked about a few times already in this video, ATP, is the molecule that supplies energy for cells. So a good example of that is uh, digestion. Whenever you eat food, you know, the food gets broken down, uh, releasing energy, for example. But in order for the cells to use that energy, the nutrients have to be converted to ATP. Into an energy transferring molecule. If you can't access this compound, then you can't use it. So that's the whole point of you know, digesting your food, taking that, that that pizza that you had for lunch, turning that into a source of energy. Now ATP is made up of a a base, a sugar, and three phosphate groups. That's why it's ATP, adenosine triphosphate, you know, three phosphates. And these phosphate groups are held together by very high energy bonds. Now those high energy bonds are very important here. When those bonds are broken, the energy that gets released is able to be used by the cell. So you're going from ATP, adenosine triphosphate. If you break one bond, you are now becoming adenosine diphosphate or two phosphates. So that ADP can now pick up another bond, storing more energy before that's broken again. And the cycle goes back and forth. So it's that breaking of that high energy bond that creates the energy that your cell is able to use. Now cells will produce ATP by a very involved process called cellular respiration. Now in this process, you have glucose from the food that you're eating, sugar is glucose, combined with oxygen. Now this chemical reaction results in production of ATP within the mitochondria. 
now there are a lot of steps that go from you know, point one you know, to the final point here but the general point of cellular respiration is to take the food that you're eating combining it with oxygen and after a, a very involved series of chemical reactions you end up getting ATP now some byproducts of this process of cellular respiration are water and carbon dioxide now the process of breathing you know, the exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide it provides the materials that you need for cellular respiration you know, if you don't have oxygen coming in then you can't create ATP and if you aren't breathing you're gonna have a lot of problems just, just in general but the less you're able to breathe in oxygen or less you're able to deliver oxygen to cells the less efficient the cellular respiration is and of course the byproduct of carbon dioxide must be eliminated from the body and this builds up and your body just can be very dangerous and very toxic so with the process of breathing whenever you exhale this is why you are exhaling carbon dioxide to get rid of it from your body All right, here's a chemical uh, equation for cellular respiration sugar C6H12O6 it's common glucose plus oxygen that you are breathing all that will give you carbon dioxide that you breathe out plus water plus a large number of ATP that's a very generic form of cellular respiration here all right, going back to the pathology connection with uh, diabetes mellitus now we've already talked about how it's related to the membrane transport but there's also a problem with cellular respiration now glucose from the food that you're eating doesn't get into the cells effectively so this results in cells looking for other substances to create energy now your cells still need a source of fuel in order to work if your cells don't work then your cells are gonna die if your cells die then tissue dies if tissue dies organs die If organs die you die so this is a very important need for cells so if they can't get the energy it needs from glucose it's gonna get it from something else so the other material that your body does tend to break down you know, to find any kind of source of fuel it can break down fat it can break down muscle it can break down proteins and any one of those three will seriously alter uh, your normal body chemistry so this buildup of glucose uh, in the body can cause a number of problems such as the the abnormal concentration gradient you know between the inside and outside of a cell your body will try to eliminate this excess glucose by filtering it in your kidneys so that's a good indicator that you have diabetes when there's uh, glucose in urine because glucose should not be in your urine at all so when this happens this will lead to uh, water loss or often dehydration that's why being thirsty is a very common symptom of being uh, diabetic also because there's so much glucose in your urine your body wants to dilute it as much as possible but by doing so it's taking water away from your body which makes you dehydrated has some symptoms caused by diabetes and these uh, abnormalities of glucose uh, weight loss because your body is now using uh, fat and muscle as a source of fuel so you will lose that that mass of, within your body uh, excessive thirst because you're dehydrated excessive urination because you're dehydrating or because you're dehydrated and then chronic long-term effects can lead to heart disease and eventually kidney failure now there are two types type 1 and type 2 uh, type 1 is called insulin dependent diabetes mellitus or early onset diabetes or juvenile diabetes this is an autoimmune disorder this is where your immune system will attack and destroy cells in the pancreas that make insulin the beta cells so if insulin can't be made then glucose can't be delivered to cells that's where you get the buildup of in, or the buildup of glucose which leads to all the problems we just talked about this is your body attacking itself to prevent insulin from even being made the other type uh, type 2 non-insulin dependent diabetes mellitus or late onset uh, diabetes this will develop when cells stop responding to insulin or being insulin uh, resistant insulin is still being produced normally but tissues just don't respond to it as well it's often caused by obesity having high cholesterol levels uh, high lipids uh, and high blood pressure now the way you treat these various forms of diabetes depends on what type that you have uh, for type 1 diabetes it's not curable you can manage it and treat it with daily insulin injections and you can stick to a very strict uh, diet for type 2 depending on how bad it is it may be able to be reversed uh, the first step is usually uh, switching to a healthier diet uh, exercising more 
and then losing weight. If you are borderline diabetic, this can usually uh, you know, put you back to normal. If you're able to control your diabetes with diet and exercise, that's usually you know, the, the best course. Uh, beyond that, you'll need some medications that will help you know, stimulate the pancreas and help to lower uh, cholesterol. So in some patients that have type 2 may eventually develop into becoming insulin dependent where they actually need insulin injections every single day because there's nothing they can do on their own other than getting these daily injections of insulin to help correct this uh, severity of diabetes. All right, next we'll talk about enzymes. Now these are what help will speed up chemical reactions within the body. So the faster these get done, the sooner things can be uh, produced or used properly. So the good thing about enzymes, these are like carrier molecules and they are not ever used up. Once they're used to speed up a reaction, they can be used again and again and again. And these are going to be very specific. These will only uh, speed up certain types of reactions by certain enzymes. So these aren't going to be generic speeding up things all over the place. They're going to be very particular for what they bind to and what kind of reactions they a speed up. That leads us to a, a pathology connection with a enzyme disorder called phenylketonuria or PKU. This is more commonly found with uh, Caucasians who are Irish or Scottish or Scandinavian. And these patients will have a missing enzyme. That enzyme is called phenylalanine hydroxylase. Without this enzyme, the amino acid phenylalanine isn't destroyed. It just builds up and builds up and builds up. And this buildup will eventually affect the nervous system. And this will eventually cause mental retardation if not treated. The other signs of PKU uh, include a very light pigmentation of the skin and the hair and the eyes. This will lead to abnormalities in posture and how a, the person walks or their gait. And it can also lead to epilepsy. So being able to treat PKU is having a diet that's low in phenylalanine. So this would include uh, avoiding high protein foods and products that are sweetened with aspartame or NutraSweet. And for people who go off diet and ignore this uh, precaution, if you are a child, this will lead to uh, cognitive uh, deficits. If you're an adult and you go off diet, this will lead to anxiety, uh, depression, and other neurological changes. As you can imagine, this would be very important to stick to your prescribed diet if you have this condition. The way you diagnose PKU. Uh, genetic tests, blood tests, and every newborn within the United States are routinely screened for PKU. Our next topic we'll talk about in this chapter, uh, mitosis. This is cellular reproduction. It's the pro uh, process of making or copying cells, also called cell division. So starting with one cell, then making two. And those two become four, and four become eight, and so on. And there are uh, different types. Uh, first one, asexual reproduction. This is where cells make identical copies of themselves but without the involvement of another cell. Now most cells, animal cells, plant cells, bacteria, are able to reproduce themselves asexually. So you don't need two cells joining together to, to create a new one. In one cell, you don't need the involvement of anything else. It just becomes two, and those two become four, and so on. So reproducing without involving sex or sex cells. All right, there are different types of cells depending on how advanced they are. In humans, we have what are called eukaryotic cells. These are cells that have a nucleus, uh, organelles, and several chromosomes in them. So the more advanced type of cells. So our cells are going to be more complex and more advanced than what you would find in a bacteria or a virus, for example. Now, because all of our chromosomes are, are, are the instructions for our cells and what make you you, all cells must have a complete set after reproduction. Otherwise, the cells wouldn't know what to do and they couldn't function. So all chromosomes must be copied first before cells can divide. So think of all the organelles, all the stuff inside one cell. All that has to be copied before you can make a second cell. So for uh, bacterial cells, for example, they don't have a nucleus, they don't have organelles. These are called prokaryotic cells. These reproduce very quickly through a process called binary fission. They basically copy their DNA and then break in half. So half the cytoplasm goes one way, the other half the cytoplasm goes the other way, and then you have two identical bacteria. So this is a very simple process because it's not, it doesn't involve that much stuff. So this process happens fairly quickly. Now cells in humans, because there's more stuff involved, it's going to be a much more of a complex process. 
first thing that must happen, all the DNA must be copied. All 46 chromosomes or 23 pairs of chromosomes must be copied and then sorted so that each cell gets a complete set. You can have some, some serious problems if you don't get a complete uh, or, or an equal splitting of these chromosomes. You don't want one cell being made to get 45 chromosomes and the other one get 47 or so on. Now 46 is what you want each cell to have. All the organelles must be copied and sorted so that every cell gets the right amount of that particular organelle. And mitosis is the only way that cells that are in humans are able to reproduce asexually. All right, the two major phases of a cell's life is what are called the cell cycle. Now, cells go through a, a predictable timeline of what they do. Now, they're created, they go through their normal function, then they get ready to divide, then they divide, and it's this process over and over again. It's the cell cycle. Now, most of a cell's life is spent in a stage called interphase. It's when it's not dividing, it's just doing its normal job. So a great majority of a cell's life is spent in this stage. So when a cell is getting ready to reproduce, that's when it enters a stage called mitosis, or the mitotic phase. And that phase is broken down into two portions. You have mitosis and cytokinesis. Now mitosis is the division of the genetic material. So it's the division of the nucleus. This is where you have prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase. So the copying of your DNA and then splitting those apart and creating two nuclei. The cytokinesis is division of the cytoplasm and everything inside the cytoplasm. Now throughout the cell cycle, there are various uh, what are called checkpoints to make sure that the process is going along like it should. If there's something wrong, then there are signals sent out to kind of shut it down. And if there are some things that can't be corrected quickly, the cell will stop going through the process and will actually uh, start to kill itself or will be destroyed by your immune cells. So you don't have a large amount of improperly made cells dividing. But if everything is fine through these checkpoints, then cell division will be allowed to, to continue. All right, so a generic overview of the cell cycle. Interphase, where the cell spends probably about 90% of its life doing its normal job. It get rid when it gets ready to divide, you enter the mitotic phase, which you have mitosis. And to further specify what goes on there, you have four phases. Prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase. After that, you have cytokinesis. At the end of this, you have two separate identical cells. All right, we'll talk about the various stages of mitosis. The first one, prophase, and the prefix pro means before, is where you have the nuclear envelope or the nuclear membrane will break down and disintegrate. The chromosomes will become much more dense and visible. And then you have the centrioles will move toward the sides of the cell and getting ready to anchor the lines for cell division or the spindle fibers. Uh, metaphase, meta means uh, between, is where you have chromosomes lining up in the center or the middle of the cell. So M for metaphase, M for middle. It's a good way to keep that straight. Uh, anaphase, an means without. So you have the chromosomes moving apart from one another as these spindles will kind of rip it apart. So A for anaphase, A for apart or away from each other. And then the last phase, uh, telophase, Telo means the end. So you have the chromosomes moving to the far end of the cell, and the spindle fibers will disappear, and the nuclear uh, membranes will start to reform. Okay, after that, you'll have the two nuclei, and then everything else in the cell has to be uh, divided up. That's called cytokinesis. So the original cell is what's called the mother cell, and what it forms are what's called the daughter cells. So the whole process of this, you want two identical daughter cells. Think of this process as a copy machine. You put in one piece of paper, you end up getting two identical pieces of paper. So that's how it should work normally. When things go wrong, that's when you get various abnormalities. Or phases of mitosis. The first one, prophase. The nuclear envelope will break down. So you can't see where the nucleus was. The chromosomes will become much more dense and visible. You get these spindle fibers start to form. Metaphase, these chromosomes line up in the middle of the cell. They almost look like uh, stitches. Anaphase, they start to be pulled apart from one another. You know, half goes this way, half goes that way. So A for anaphase, A for apart. And then uh, telophase, the chromosomes will become less dense and then will become invisible again. And the 
member or the nuclear membranes will start to reform so you will see the beginnings of two individual nuclei so this would be one nuclei or one nucleus that would be another nucleus and then after this finishes you get cytokinesis all the organelles all, all the cytoplasm are equally split up that's how you get two identical copies of the original cell all right the uh, purpose of mitosis uh, cells have to be replaced some cells need to be replaced all the time such as cells in your skin the cell division there happens on a daily basis because so much of your skin cells are lost every single day so you need cell division or cell reproduction to replace old cells replace damaged cells it's also how you grow you know we all start off as one single cell that fertilized egg the zygote that one cell must become two two four eight sixteen so on and so on until you get to the you know, trillions that make up a newborn baby this is how we get larger in size and taller now that process of mitosis is true for most cells in the body except for uh, sex cells that process is called meiosis uh, meiosis only happens in uh, the sperm cells in males and then the egg cells in females and one of the big differences between meiosis and mitosis instead of having two daughter cells made you get four daughter cells made and probably the biggest difference between the two these four daughter cells are not identical to each other they're going to be genetically different from the other three and then also from the parent cell this is how you're able to have a variety of genetic information from the same parents so if you have a brother or sister unless you're an identical twin you are not the same genetically from your brothers and sisters even though you may have the same parents it's a different a different order of genes that make you you and not your brother or not your sister so the whole point of having more cells produced to create a, a variety of genetic information All right, now we'll talk about another uh, pathology connection I'll talk about cancer now when a body is healthy cells grow in a very orderly predictable way and there are checkpoints and other control systems used in the cell that prevent cells from reproducing you know, too quickly but with cancer that's not the case and sometimes conditions can be changed where cells grow in a very uncontrolled way that's what happens with you have or when you have cancer cells will grow much faster than they should and these cells are going to be uh, because they're growing so quickly and dividing so quickly will be non-functional and these cells will grow on top of one another and they keep growing and growing and growing and that's what you have a tumor or a mass of cancer cells sometimes they can be benign you know, and not serious or they can be malignant which is very serious but this is how all cancers start off as a uncontrolled uh, cell division of cells uh, tumors that are benign usually will grow very slowly they usually will push out healthy cells out of their way and in general not life-threatening they still cause issues but if you have to have cancer benign is what you want okay, the opposite of that uh, malignant tumors these will have very rapid growth these will tend to invade other healthy tissues or spreading to other tissues which is when cancers become you know, quite serious when they start to spread or metastasize to other parts of the body now these types of tumors can be uh, are able to enter the blood and lymphatic system which will start the process of forming new tumor cells new tumors in other parts of the body and that's how you get a cell metastasizing through various parts of the body once it enters the lymphatic system once it enters the blood system is able to set up shop and grow in a totally different location and the prognosis is often determined by what stage that the cancer is being uh, diagnosed in the lower the number uh, the better and the higher the number of the stage the more serious it is uh, for stage one uh, no cancer has spread you know, these stages are based on the amount of uh, metastasis of this cancer so stage one a uh, cancer has not spread which is good uh, stage two it has spread to nearby tissues uh, stage three is spread to the lymphatic system and then stage four uh, spread to distant organs at stage four it's the most serious uh, it can be you know, there is no stage five because at that point if it can't be treated or managed by by this point the person will not survive and there are other ways to classify uh, these stages when you have a tumor characteristic or extent it's called uh, T when you have lymph nodes that are invaded it's called N 
so the number of lymph nodes invaded. And then when you have any tumor uh, metastasis, it's called M for metastasis. Now ways to diagnose cancer, uh, various imaging techniques, MRIs, uh, CT scans, x-rays, uh, various blood tests, and of course biopsies, you know, the surgical examination of tissue that's been removed you know, to examine under a microscope. Uh, treatments of cancers, usually more than one type will be used depending on how uh, advanced the stage is. Uh, chemotherapy, you know, chemo means as a reference to chemicals, so using chemicals to treat rapidly dividing cells. I uh, also have radiation, uh, using energy to target cancer cells. So some patients may only need radiation, some people may need both, depending on what type of cancer they may have and where they may have it. Uh, surgery, uh, there was a form of treatment, you know, removing the cancer cells uh, from the body. And lastly, uh, biological or immunotherapy. Uh, this will help train your body's natural immune system to fight the cancer cells. All right, next we'll talk about uh, various microorganisms. And the, the main microorganisms uh, we'll talk about here are bacteria, viruses, fungi, and protozoas. First, we'll talk about uh, bacteria. Now, the actual definition of the term pathogen, you know, we've talked about this term before. A pathogen is anything that causes disease. So anything that makes you sick. And bacteria make up the biggest bulk of pathogens. Now, some bacteria are very harmless. Some are actually very necessary for you to function, especially with your digestive system. You, we all have, as humans, a normal amount of bacteria found both on our skin and within our intestines to help us digest food. Now, some of these bacteria help us to make vitamin K, which is very critical for uh, the clotting of blood. So not all bacteria are bad. Now, many bacteria are very necessary and very helpful. Here are some images and illustrations of bacteria. Okay, up here is a basic illustration of a of a bacillus or a rod shaped bacterium. Here you have a spherical shaped or, co or cosi bacteria. When they're grouped in two, groups of two, the uh, diplo cosi. When they're in the chain, kind of like a, a, a pearl necklace, you no know, end, end, end. They're called streptococci. And strep always means in a chain. When they're grouped in clusters, kind of like grapes on a vine, or in a bunch, they're called stapha, so staphylococci. So these right here, the diplococci right there, would be these. All right, viruses. These are infectious particles that have uh, a core that have genetic material that are surrounded by a protective coat called a capsid. Now, viruses can't do anything on their own. You know, they can't grow, they can't eat, they can't reproduce, they can't even hardly move without the help of a host. And what they do is once they get inside a host, they take over cells and force those cells to do uh, what they want them to. You know, giving them energy, giving them food, giving them, giving them a method to reproduce. But on their own, viruses can't do anything. Now a common term that people often use incorrectly, viruses do not respond to antibiotics. People will use antibiotics as a very general term, which is incorrect. Antibiotics will only act on bacterial infections. If you are treating a viral infection like a flu or a cold, you are using an antiviral medication. So, so an antibiotic is not something that makes you get better. It makes you get better if you are treating a bacterial infection, yes. Here's a generic image or illustration of one. Of the genetic information inside here, surrounded by the capsid and the uh, envelope on the outside, this is how this type would look. And just like bacteria, they come in different types of shapes. So it's not all like this. Not all bacteria are going to be round. Some are round, some are corkscrew shaped. Uh, same thing with viruses. Sometimes they're round, sometimes they're uh, cigar shaped, sometimes they are you know, oblong shaped. So there are various shapes for both viruses and bacteria. All right, we'll talk about uh, fungi. And fungi is just a plural form of the word fungus. These can be uh, either a one-celled or even a multi-celled organism. And these are plant-like organisms that have uh, tiny filaments called uh, mycelia that travel out of the cell to find, find a source of nutrients and then absorb them. Now, some fungi are good and some are not. A good example of some good kind are the are edible mushrooms and some that are very serious that can cause some disease. Fungi are spread through the release of fungal spores. And some examples of uh, fungal infections include uh, athlete's foot, uh, thrush, or candidiasis. Here's some examples of fungus. You know, yeast is a fungus, uh, ringworm, 
this would be a thrush here, and fungal infection on the tongue. All right, next we'll talk about uh, protozoa. Protozoa are going to be one-celled and uh, animal-like organisms that can be found in either the soil or in the water. Now, diseases caused by these organisms can be a result from either swallowing them or being bitten by insects that carry them. Here are some good examples. Sleeping sickness disease, malaria, and amoebic dysentery are all caused by protozoans. In the case of malaria, malaria is a, a protozoan called plasmodium that infects certain types of mosquitoes. When mosquitoes bite you, that plasmodium gets into your red blood cells and infects those. That's how you get sick. So it's not the mosquito bite itself, it's the protozoan that they carry. All right, now we'll talk about the pathology connection, how these organisms can cause disease. Uh, for bacteria, they can destroy body tissues, they can destroy body cells, they can inhibit ribosomes from functioning correctly, they can cause, or cause fluid loss, uh, high fever, they can uh, decrease your blood pressure, they can increase blood clotting, they can cause a fluid buildup in the lungs, they can cause uh, paralysis even. Some signs of some bacterial infections, having a high fever, having a very rapid pulse or rapid breathing, having a abnormal foul smelling discharge from an area that gets infected, uh, pain at an infection site, and swelling at an infection site. Of course, the way you treat bacterial infections are through antibiotics. These are chemicals that kill these types of bacteria without harming your normal uh, body cells. And most antibiotics are produced naturally by other microorganisms. Again, the key thing is is here, they will attack the bacterial cells but not impact your normal uh, eukaryotic cells. All right, here's some common bacterial uh, pathogens and their related diseases. Staph aureus, skin infections, uh, food poisoning, uh, strep throat with a strep biogenes, strep pneumonia, uh, lobar pneumonia, clostridium tetani, tetanus, clostridium botulinum, botulism, bacillus anthracis, uh, anthrax, gonorrhea, Salmonella, Legionnaire's disease, urinary tract infection. All these are caused by various forms of bacteria. Next, we'll move on to viruses. Viruses can cause disease by basically taking over and shutting down a cell. They can cause a cell to rupture and release large numbers of copies of that virus, and they go on to infect other cells. These will often make a good environment for a secondary bacterial infection or a fungal infection. A good example of that is influenza, which is caused by a virus, the flu virus, will often lead to a secondary bacterial infection, which leads to uh, bacterial pneumonia. Now, some common signs of a viral infection, a low-grade fever, sometimes this can be high though, uh, muscle aches, general fatigue, and sometimes you'll have uh, little or no symptoms at all. Now, some of these may uh, be latent, which means they're hidden without symptoms for many years, only to activate much later on, usually due to an increase in stress uh, in your life. Some diseases that are caused by viruses may become chronic, causing low-level symptoms for weeks or months or even years. And there are a few treatments for viral infections. Uh, like we mentioned before, antibiotics will, will not do anything for viruses. Antibiotics only work on bacterium. Some treatment is uh, rest, fluids, manage the symptoms to keep the person comfortable, uh, antiviral drugs. But because the viruses will use your own cells' uh, machinery to reproduce and to function, these drugs will often affect your cells as well causing uh, various side effects. Uh, here are some very common viral pathogens and their related diseases. On top, you have some various DNA viruses, you know, herpes, you know, simplex 1 and 2, uh, varicella zoster, which causes uh, chickenpox, and children, and as you get older, will lead to shingles, uh, hepatitis B, uh, Epstein-Barr, very common. Uh, some RNA viruses, influenza A, B, and C, the common flu that you think of, rhinovirus, the common cold, caused by an RNA virus, and the HIV virus, human immunodeficiency virus. All right, some uh, fungal infections. Uh, these are caused by spores that are inhaled, and these spores enter the body uh, through open wounds commonly. And these spores are going to be really tiny bodies that are resistant to environmental changes. So that means they're able to stay dormant until the conditions that they need are just right. So they can stay there for a very long amount of time and not do anything until they get the right conditions that they need. Now, most fungal spores do not cause disease in healthy people, but the exception is uh, some fungal infections of the skin, uh, such as uh, chalk itch or athlete's foot. You can be perfectly healthy and get either one or even both of these because they are infections of the skin. Now, many fungal infections are what are called opportunistic. These will only cause disease in people who are compromised already with their immune system because of some other condition or some other uh, disease. 
Uh, some symptoms of fungal infections will vary depending on what area is being infected. Treatment of fungal infections is uh, difficult. Some antifungal drugs are very toxic, and many fungal infections are resistant to treatment. Uh, diseases caused by protozoans. Now, most protozoan infections are caused by uh, insect bites, like we have with uh, malaria, and ingesting the uh, contaminated water. They have these protozoans living within the water. And many protozoans are parasites. Now, the symptoms will vary depending on what type of protozoan is causing the infection. Some can be uh, very serious, uh, causing long-term building illness, like malaria. Some can be relatively mild, such as uh, beaver fever, which is caused by the protozoan uh, giarda. It's a protozoan that lives in water supplies and streams that are contaminated by uh, fecal matter. All right, and that brings us to the end of uh, this chapter in our course on anatomy and physiology for health professionals. And we will continue this course in future videos.